Thank you so much. I'm Mel Hightower, as was mentioned, a financial health network board member and a past financial services executive. And I'm excited for this conversation to really bring us all home about the lessons that we've learned and the connections and ideas that we've had over the course of this, these wonderful three days together. So, and I'm excited to introduce our incredible panelists joining us. We have Ariane Shuta, who is the, to my immediate right, who is the founder and managing partner of Core Innovation Capital, a venture capital fund that is investing in financial services companies that empower everyday Americans. A leading consumer finance expert and advocate for financial inclusion, he has served on the CFPB's Consumer Advisory Board and as a senior advisor to the Financial Health Network, which he helped start in 2004. We also are welcoming to the stage Ida Rademacher, Ida is a vice president of the Aspen Institute and co-executive director of the Aspen Financial Security Program, where she also leads the Aspen Partnership for an Inclusive Economy. Known for her innovative approaches to economic inclusion, she has spearheaded multiple initiatives and previously led the CFPB's Consumer Financial Wellbeing Metrics Project at Prosperity Now. And Rounding out our panel, we have David Clooney, who is a partner at Edward Jones and the head of community relations, focusing on investments that advance financial strength and inclusive growth. He serves on the National Urban League's board, the Treasury Advisory Committee on Racial Equity, and the SBA Council on Underserved Communities. And he's previously held roles including the executive director of the Black Economic Alliance, and Managing Director at J.P. Morgan. Let's take a moment and welcome our incredible panelists to the stage. So we've spent the last three days really talking about how do we move financial health forward? And we've heard from a few conversations. I'm thinking of the Barber of Little Rock. I'm thinking of Stephanie Land who said really at its core, at its foundation, financial health is really an income issue because it's hard to really think about the path forward when you are really just trying to survive. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and on whether we should be focusing and having a mind shift, mindset shift to focus on income rather than really looking at economic solutions. Ida, why don't we start with you? Um, it's, it's so daunting to try to be the kind of synthesis group here, but, uh, and that's a super provocative question, so thank you. Uh, and Jennifer, congratulations on 20 years with the Financial Health Network. Uh, I'll follow you anywhere, woman, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> I, I think for me, it's uh, the wrong question, just full stop. Um, we all need the biggest toolbox we can have as we start to face some of the accelerating drivers of macroeconomic change that are going to filter down and create even more destabilizing issues at the household level. Um, you know, a lot of people know that I'm relatively obsessed with the future of wealth. One of the functions of wealth is income. Capital income is just as important to be thinking about for more people in this country and around the world as labor income. And we've seen even at this conference many of the ways that people can walk and chew gum on this issue. Let's build employee ownership into the way that we describe a quality job. Let's think about the upstream governance structures so that people have ways to build wealth which can be then coupled with an insurance product to create annuities so that we have a way to buttress social security with additional kinds of capital income streams. This is not an either or. Yes, it's very hard, as Raj Date once said, to swing a baseball bat when you're standing in a canoe, but you can't tell me that anybody that we know in our own lives doesn't have the same kind of aspirational goals for generational wealth for their families that, they, that we have, and I think it's irresponsible not to be ambitious about a full solution set for the households that we do this work for. 
David, do you think about it the same way in that it's a parallel path as opposed to one coming before the other? Absolutely. I, I, there's no silver bullet, um, one solution. We have to be thinking about all of the different points of entry, points of access we have to get people on a path to building wealth and thinking about the many segments uh, of our population that have been separated from the opportunity to ever acquire and build assets. Um, those of us who are doing this work, I think, would be smart to look at all of the different ways we've been able to create um, really accelerate folks on the path to, to social and particularly economic mobility. Um, so the ways that we are, I think I am pushing us in the private sector especially to be um, more asset forward in doing this work. And so, you know, as we're putting together solutions and, and initiatives, actually putting money in people's hands or putting together programs that help people um, like, you know, ownership uh, in, in their employment, starting to figure out ways uh, to give folks an asset to build and grow. I can't disagree with what you guys are saying. Um, however, um, well, and I'm putting my money where our, our mouths are, right? Like we're making bets on uh, ways in which people can both save money and increase their um, net worth. That is outside of income. However, I like I we can't ignore that, and. You know, in the beginning of anyone's life, we have more time than we have money, and we need to find ways to make our time uh, worth more. Maybe the reason that it's not worth talking about that much is because um, we all have different levers to pull. And so, you know, the income question to my, to my mind is more of a policy question, an industrial policy question, which I think is a super important one. And I think looking at how we measure unemployment, you know, can be big and important levers to how we reimagine income. I do think income is really important because we all, or most of us, start with nothing and a lot of time and we need to make that time into something. But the area where we can all do stuff is probably on the other side and I'm, I'm very excited about um, finding ways to um, increase ownership. And it's an interesting point because each of you represents a different aspect of the solution and, and the financial services community. So I'd like to talk about some of the emerging trends that were discussed at this conference. And this morning, in fact, we were talking about AI. And Ariana, I would like to start with you. I'd like to get your take on AI and just what you see as the tangible ways that we can harness productivity. Um, and innovative solutions that AI offers while also navigating the risk that it brings into to play as well in terms of um, you know, job elimination, et cetera? Well, talk about big, broad questions. <laughs> um, AI can go in many ways. I think the, con the general fear is that it goes the way of big corporates and I'm quite optimistic that it will also go the way of the little guy. Um, 20 years ago when I was at the Media Lab, there were two threads of AI. There was the AI crowd who were basically building an independent intelligence, and then there was the augmented intelligence crowd, which is basically building the cyborg. And the idea is like humans have a dizzying array of unique capabilities, and AI then, and now it's much more advanced, will always um, be inferior across the, the broad range of things that we do. And so if we can make AI to make us stronger in some way or another, whether that be an exoskeleton as some kind of a physical thing, or make us smarter at a particular task, better writers, better, you know, like, uh, better uh, financial analysts, et cetera, I think there's tremendous opportunity for AI to empower a dizzying array of people in their productivity. So making it possible for a very small number of people or individual contractors to just put out a lot more work. And I think uh, conceivably to buck this trend that you know, from since the 70s productivity has gone up and our uh, hourly wages have stayed stagnant. I think there's a real world case to be made where augmented intelligence applications in many ways that we haven't seen yet um, will make it possible for 
our hourly wage uh, to have a separation effect from what it's been in the last 30, 40 years. Great. Any other thoughts from the panel on AI? All right. I, I want to talk about maybe then another disruptive force because I think that's been the focus of a, a number of the sessions that we've had here. Um, and that's climate change, uh, which I think was also discussed this morning. So, and what we're seeing now, much like healthcare was before, climate is really becoming more and more interlinked um, with financial health and, and, and that they're both thought of pressing urgent issues. Ida, how are you seeing those two topics being interlinked, or do you think it's a broader metaphor for a disruptive force that we need to solve if we're going to have an inclusive economy? Um, I'll probably take the answer. I mean, basically, whatever Lee said on the last panel when I was in the back, you know, listen to that. It's important. <laughs> uh, I think it, look, I think that the growing realization of the subtext of climate means um, an exacerbation of the kinds of financial shocks that are going to happen in households. And again, n getting back to not just income, not just wealth, we need to talk more about insurance. We need to talk more about pooling risk. Uh, we need to talk about where innovation happens in those spaces and that, the complementary set of things. But the, other, the, the two other things I'll say about climate are, um, on the other side, I think when you look at the inevitability of one of the drivers of economic change is going to be the investments made in an energy transition. That to our points about ownership and opportunity, there's not just a need to mitigate the risks and the shocks in people's lives, there's a need to look upstream and see what are the economic opportunities of very intentionally aligning an equity transition to ride the rails of an energy transition. What are the governance structures of next generation companies? Where is wealth going to be created in that new economy? How is the financing going to happen? It's not just about making sure that there aren't adverse effects in households and families. It's about imagining the possibility that multiple additional communities could benefit from the transitions that are underway. And that happens the same in terms of tech. I think that actually AI and climate are two use cases we need to challenge ourselves to think about a little bit more in terms of the upside opportunities of who gets a stake in the growth of those industries. So I think that's an exciting piece. And the last thing I'll say there is, I've actually taken climate to be much more of a, and we'll probably get into this, much more metaphorically useful to us thinking in a financial health field. You know, when I look at the, the way that the climate set of advocates and scientists and everybody have organized over time to converge on a clear set of probable models of what's gonna happen without intervention and to use that to galvanize action, you know, I wouldn't say that net zero is the right, we don't know that we're going to achieve it, but wow, I don't care if you're a church or a community or a corporation or a household, you're able to now articulate what your thing is, what you, if you care about that issue, how what you are doing connects to that net zero outcome. I, we need our net zero <laughs> for the financial health movement. We don't just need to be able to measure how households are, we need to be able to say where we're trying to go. I think that you know, the, the other provocative thing to say there is that I think, look, I think carbon concentration is to climate what wealth concentration is to inequality. I think it is the um, highest level distilled measure of all the ways that systems are not working for people and creating disparity. And so if we're going to set our ambitions and use climate as both a metaphor and an aligned set of work, um, you know, we have to get busy. If I can add to that. Um... I think for those of us who are focused on financial health, there is a very powerful role we're playing in, uh, in um, climate change. And the example that I'm really intrigued by is, you know, Al Gore went for decades and gave his slideshow all around the world. And when he went to India, they basically said, go home, fix your own problems. We have an basically a financial health problem, an economic uh, development problem that we're trying to solve. And if that takes fossil fuels, it takes fossil fuels. And um, I increasingly, as, as we see um, kind of, you know, wealth growing in emerging markets and wealth flat in the Western economy, 
and a rise kind of a populism both in the United States and in Europe, I believe that those of us who are focused on financial health are really unlocking the opportunities for us to focus on um, um, climate change by achieving some level of financial health. Without that, people are gonna vote with their dollars for more economic security before we start thinking about um, climate change in a less extreme version of what you know, like we could see in like India. Right, so it's the baseline issue that makes all other issue-driven work possible. At risk of self-importance? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Can I just make a quick plus one to that, which is, um, you know, that, that has been a tried and true um, strategy in the business community, and it's something we certainly do at Edward Jones, for example. You know, we um, just crossed the threshold of having $2 trillion in, we call it assets under care, assets under management. Um, and for our future goals, we have a very specific sense of, you know, what numbers we're trying to get to, how many households we want to serve, how much we want to have um, assets under care, et cetera. Um, and we know that in order to get there, there are certain things we have, you know, that will get us part of the way there that we're doing already. But there are things we have to do to get more folks into, you know, our business model, into, um, you know, the, the ability to, uh, to even have a wealth management, uh, a wealth advisor. Um, and, and that requires us doing different things, going to different communities, um, and really bringing folks off the sidelines. So I think the, the, the point that is made about needing for this work to set a very specific target, and I think we have enough data now to know, um, you know what some of the, the challenges are, but we can put a number to it that's close enough. Um, I think that helps us be sufficiently ambitious, but also you know, data-driven in, um, in, in trying to go after that goal. And, uh, and that's something that would be good for those of us in this room and the communities we all work in to start to work to it together. No, I think that makes a lot of sense, and it's sort of what Ida was mentioning in that in order to all kind of row in the same direction, you need a target. And true systems change when you're changing mental models, when you're changing power structures, relationships. You need that big audacious goal in order to do that and move forward. Um, and it seems like Edward Jones has done, set the goal and sort of is now doing the, the work to really think about what are all the different pathways to get there, right? In Ida, Ariane, in either of your areas, has there been a goal set that you're able to talk about that you're trying to really identify and, and crystallize what you're measuring in terms of the, your impact? Sure. Um, so CORE, uh, my firm actually spun out of the Financial Health Lab uh, many moons ago. And um, someone got me a ticket to the Clinton Global Initiative in 2009 and kind of the vernacular of that is that you set a commitment. And so I pulled a number out of my hat, $2 billion or $6 billion. That seemed like an, an obscene amount of money. So could we write a bunch of checks into early stage startups that could create $6 billion of good stuff for the un and underbanked? And now 14 years later, um, our, the, port, the 90 or so companies we've invested in have created about $170 billion, which sounds very exciting and is very exciting. Although when I did a kind of an honest look back on that a couple of years ago, I realized that that's basically $100 per household per month, which is welcome. Everyone would love an extra $100. Um, but it also really doesn't change anyone's life. Right? If you're making, even if you're very poor and you're making $16,000, now having $17,000 doesn't let you send anyone to school, doesn't let you buy a home, it doesn't really change the trajectory of your house at all. And uh, at least in venture land, I find there's tremendous power to just adding a zero. So uh, we talk about 10x, 100x. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, if $170 billion is like basically chump change and not moving the dial, what if we add a zero? So, you know, like, is it, is it even possible to create a trillion dollars of net new net worth? Which sounds kind of like a, you know, like a crazy, audacious, unachievable thing. It isn't. It's actually quite possible. And so that's, that's our North Star now. So by 2035, I hope you invite me back, Jennifer. Um, I hope that we can say that we achieved, and if we actually can through our portfolio companies, then we will for sure, right? Like people will have 
there will be millions of households that would have changed the trajectory of their outlook. Um, so for all of us, right, like we're a totally self-selected crowd here. We're here because we're, we like this and we think it's important. Um, it, setting goals, whatever they are, uh, is so, so important. And so I hope people walk away and set some goal that sounds obscene um, and then reorganizes and finds a way to achieve that goal. Uh, that's probably the, the way that, to the title of the session, the way I would rewire our system, right? Like, let's set crazy goals and figure out ways to achieve them. Yeah, no, I agree with that. In one of my prior roles, I remember setting what I thought was a safe goal, a goal that was infinitely achievable. And I remember my CEO saying, I need, that doesn't matter. I need a number that is actually going to make the executives sit up and go, wait a minute. That's huge. That's the impact, if that's the impact the strategy could have. So I think it, there's something to take away from that and that you need something, if you're trying to build consensus, you know, having something that's truly gonna make an impact on the bottom line uh, for your companies or the community is something that can help you build it pretty quickly. Ida, what about, what's your goal? I mean, it's changing every time I listen to you guys talk, but not really. Just add a zero, apparently, according to Ariane. <laughs> Boom. Just gonna add a zero. Just, just round up, everybody, just round up. A bajillion. Um, <laughs> you have to do that with your finger like this, you know, like, I'm joking myself. Um, Look, I think one of the reasons that sometimes we forget that we can be a little bit audacious is that we, we forget to count the power of capital markets to help add those zeros sometimes. So for me, the solution set is, I think that to galvanize people to go forward, which is, you know, I love thinking about how, where is there an Ariane and a David in multiple of the systems we're talking about who um, have grounded knowledge about the value of creating solutions for people for whom others have discounted that there is a, some part of market solution. There's also a need to get together and acknowledge when markets fail and we need broader solutions, but I don't think we really get critical mass here if we start with the entire conversation about redistribution from um, however economic growth is happening right now versus fundamentally saying what's the primary distribution of an economy and how do more people get a stake in that across the board? When we, and just to, you know, in that sense, again, with the wealth thing, um, you know, look, the bottom 50% of the population in this country historically has never owned more than 3% of the wealth and taken home 35% of the income. Um, when we started to think about um, a North Star goal for wealth, you know, I was thinking two, three X, and the team, as they started thinking about what are the set of solutions, you're like, what would you do? It's like, okay, we think it's possible. You could talk about closing the wealth gaps, race, gender, generation, geography. You could come up with solutions for that, but it's harder to measure closing a gap because multiple things are driving that gap at all times. But could you 10 X wealth in the next 25 years? Could you measure the starting point? Could we figure out how all of those solutions contribute to it? Is there, a, is there already data systems that can help us there? So um, now you could also imagine that we might want to say, oh my God, what would happen to inflation if everybody had 10x the wealth? I think one, recognizing that a lot of people are actually starting in net debt or that the median wealth of an African-American single mother in this country, I believe it's gone up a lot since in the last survey of consumer finances, but we're still talking about um, something that looks more like most people's emergency savings um, on a bad day. So we can afford to be aspirational here. And I think people are excited about that kind of goal. And I think that again, when you think about that pathway to wealth being stabilize income, recover from shocks with all the tools at our disposal and build investable sums and have the kind of financing and affordable assets to purchase, this is the other place where it comes all the way back around to needing to democratize and um, expand the kind of investable ideas we have for where people could build wealth. So this is where I'm excited about, I don't know a much nuts yet about the tokenization of real world assets, but I'm very, I'm interested in finding out who's going in that direction and how we can make sure we're at the tables to be thinking for households about how these changes can be leveraged. So I love what you said about thinking about an integrated solution across all measures and making sure that we're thinking about 
the power of the capital markets in order to bring that forward. And so as we look forward, I guess a final question for each of you is, if we're focusing on one thing, knowing that we can multitask and knowing that it takes, a, it's gonna take movement from a lot of different um, parts of the community in order to move this forward, each of you represents a different area. So what's the one thing that we should be focusing on from, from your perspective over the next five years if we truly want to drive financial health forward? I'm happy to start and, and I'll, I'll say, I'm gonna add something to my answer. So I think inclusion is a necessary component of any future strategy we're gonna have. We, we, you know, some of the numbers we've seen in the last few years about the lost, um, what we have lost economically as a result of the gaps, uh, and you think about just the racial wealth gap um, that San Francisco Fed and Brookings put out the data, and there's data all over the place that it was $51 trillion in a 30-year period that the, you know, we lost in um, economic output. Of course, there are other factors there, uh, and that if you were to, uh, city put out a report, if you were to close uh, the racial wealth gap, the black-white wealth gap, you could add $5 trillion to US GDP uh, in, in the next five years. Um, so I think about that as a component of what we need to do um, how we are bringing, proactively bringing folks off the sidelines, as Ida said, you know, looking at the, the bottom line business value in, uh, you know, those of us in different spaces, venture, um, you know, thought leadership, uh, the, the business community, looking at the, the business value of bringing folks off the sideline. But I do think, you know, I, I now walk away from this discussion uh, with the, the thought about setting a particular target that brings us all together toward a, toward a North Star. Yeah, it's interesting that you focus on inclusion at a time where inclusion is being challenged on a number of directions in terms of who gets included or is focusing on a particular population inclusion or, or, or something else. And so I think that, that sort of staying the path and having inclusion as your central focus is interesting. And I'll just say very quickly, I think it's because of, of those attacks on, you know, on this work, I think it's making the business case that becomes even more important about it being a dollars and cents issue, not a political issue. Right. That's right. I mean, I'll, I'll key off of that. It feels more important for me to say that than what the next five years are, because it's, it's collective work. You know, right. this convening is so essential. Find your people. Find people who inspire you, find people that hold you accountable for the leadership you're gonna put a gauntlet on. You know, we just, we need more people doing ambitious work um, and finding each other. The issue, I just think, the ESG and DEI um, in this moment is the, the ability to, for many courageous leaders to say, in fact, this is truly about the systemic risks facing my business if I don't start to understand how to work on addressing the things that are primarily external, you know, social and environmental issues in our mainstream economy, are, we call them externalities. We do not know how to price those risks. Those movements have been about an essential effort, a very data-driven effort, to assess and manage long-term risk, and the inability to think hard about a diverse workforce as being part of resilience, a pipeline as being part of that. These are, you know, to think hard about these issues, which is why we've been thinking a lot more about, you know, like what are election-proof framing may get away from some of those things and mean a lot of the same issues, like an ownership economy invests in a lot of the same stuff, you know, like when we start thinking about it. So I think that, you know, I don't want to be too cute about worrying about the language, but I do think that in many ways the opportunity here is to start to lean into what it really means to be a responsible fiduciary in your business about managing the risks that would undermine your business, your profitability, or your workers' um, well-being and productivity. So those are, those are not the meaningful moral reasons I do this work, but at the moment they're really important parts for us to get even more articulate about as we push this work forward. My favorite Banksy quote is, there's no one more dangerous than someone who claims to want to change the world. And that's arguably all of us. And so I feel like it's very easy to pat ourselves in the back for having good intentions. And we should have, and we should continue those good intentions. But what we should ask ourselves is like, how much, how, how badly do we want this to happen? And what are we willing to give up? 
for this to happen, or said in financial services speak, how much are we willing to risk? And I think we all have to put our capital at risk at certain, at certain level, which means we have to do so in a way that's responsible to our asset class. Um, but I think finding ways to, to, if we believe at some level the world is economic, um, to find alignment between the outcomes that we care about, the externalities, and, um, and profitability at a certain level, right? Like in, most of us are in, in financial services institutions in one form or another. Um, creating that economic alignment, I think, is the way, uh, is the way forward. It's interesting that each of you are focused on really, at its core, recognizing that we are operating within a capitalist system. Instead of having financial health be something that is an externality to that system, having it be core to driving the growth in that system, whether it's from, Ida, you mentioned managing the risk and ensuring that um, resilience is part of the fabric. Ariane, you were talking about how do we have economic alignment to ensure that there's the appropriate financial incentives for, for folks to want to think about that. And David, you mentioned inclusion as the engine um, that could really drive growth. It's particularly be a source of new growth as we think about new clients and customers um, that we may not have accessed before and that if we can think of a way to serve them in an economically efficient way, that that can actually yield untapped growth. But it's funny that at the same time, a lot of the um, conversation around, that I've seen around this, it has, some of the conversation I've seen around ownership and of these systems have, has been somewhat anti-capitalist, I think, at a time. So it's, it's interesting, I think, that, um, that working within the system is the path forward. And I don't know if there's any thoughts that either, that any of you have on that that you'd like to share. I'd call it, and we coined this term at the Black Economic Alliance when I was there, inclusive capitalism. Yeah. It is, you put it exactly right, it is tapping into untapped potential in, in the market. Right. And we can find it in so many different places. So it is, I think it is pro-capitalist, not anti-capitalist. Right. Okay. Pro-capitalism, but also transformative in the way we think about yes. who has capital. Yeah. I'll give you a sneak peek of the book proposal that I'm working on, right? Ooh. So my working, my work, I'm a, I'm a horse person, for those who don't know, I'm, you know, I, I do have like a dress I can wear, but mainly I'm happier in a barn, uh, cleaning stalls, but uh, so, look, I, I think we stopped innovating on who is fully benefits from a capital, from, from capital markets, from the way markets work. So half broke capitalism is what I'm gonna call it these days, and you know, in, in horse world, if a horse is half broke, it doesn't mean that it's you know, injured, it means that it's in the process of being trained. It's highly powerful and then highly dangerous, unpredictable. But you follow that process through and then you have this incredibly beautiful, fierce, strong power that you are harnessing. I mean, the metaphor will end plenty, in plenty of ways and believe me, I'm gonna run it down you know, in some way, in ways, but my own sense is uh, it, we, capitalism is still in the process of being created as something that we can all benefit from in different ways. And that doesn't go without consumer protection, regulation, strong governance makes strong capital. But I do think that there is an exploratory way to think about harnessing this. I don't know that we really should say, wow, we're in late stage capitalism. Um, I think that the conflation right now is really about voice, agency, and governance. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about some of the Web3 world, and again, all of it highly speculative right now, but the ability to have open source foundations and think about the new structures of ownership as part of a solution versus antithetical to capital markets is an exciting place to spend a little bit of our, of our time without forgetting that at the end of the day for this, and even an ethos of a financial health community is, um, the care, safety, and generational um, support uh, of people with their own hearts and dreams and ability to be in the economy and all the ways that, um, um, that we express our humanity. I think that's a wonderful way to end. David, Ida, Ariane, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for this discussion on rewiring the system. Thank you.